in the chapter Horcruxes, <clears throat> here he goes in to have a lesson with Dumbledore, the bottom of 496. Or, let me rephrase that. Here he goes in to bring Dumbledore the memory. Bottom of, I think it's around 496. Got 496 question mark written. So, um, I don't have any other page number. <coughs> they watch the memory, and we hear Slughorn tell Tom Riddle, because Tom Riddle asks about Horcruxes. Wondered whether you know anything about Horcruxes. <coughs> And Slughorn says, well, dot, 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 skipping a couple sentences. A horcrux is just the word used for an object in which a person has concealed part of their soul. Riddle, uh, what do you mean? I don't understand. Well, you split your soul, you see. Hide part of it in an object outside the body. Then, even if one's body is attacked or destroyed, Uh, one cannot die, for part of the soul remains earthbound and undamaged. But of course, existence in such a form, dot, dot, dot. Why the dot, dot, dot? What does it he finish saying? What did Ferenz tell Harry, first book, about existence in such a form that would rely on drinking unicorn's blood. It'd be like a half-life and cursed. Cursed. Okay. Few would want it, Tom. Notice. Existence such a, in such a form, dot, dot, dot. And Harry remembers, I was ripped from my body, I was less than spirit, less than the meanest ghost, but still I was alive. Few would want it, Tom, very few. Death would be preferable. Notice, Tom doesn't say, why? He doesn't ask, why would death be preferable? He asks, but how do you split your soul? He wants to get to the nuts and bolts. Well, I mean, the soul, he says, is supposed to remain intact and whole. Splitting it is an act of violation. It is, and it's the first time she kind of introduces this idea. It is against nature. That is, it goes against the the order of the world. It goes against logos, okay? Structure, order, etc. Now she doesn't say, she doesn't have Slughorn say, it goes against God's will. She uses nature. But how do you do it? In other words, don't tell don't talk to me about morality. I want to know how. By an act of evil, the supreme act of evil. What's the supreme act of evil? Committing murder. Why is that the supreme act of evil? You know, those, those three unforgivable curses, it wraps all three of them together. Because when you commit murder, what are you doing? You're taking somebody's will, not temporarily, you're doing it permanently. Crucianus, yeah. It's a form of torture. It's torture to the nth degree. And then finally, you know, denying the person the life that they are, according to the Declaration of Independence, you know, granted by nature and nature's God. Killing rips the soul apart. The wizard intent upon creating a horcrux would use the damage to his advantage. He would encase the... How? Notice, write me the instructions. Give me the recipe, so to speak. He goes, I don't know. There's a spell. Tom Riddle asks, what I don't understand, though, I mean, 
out of curiosity, you know, just for the sake of academic study and argument, would one horcrux be much use? Notice, what's the purpose of a horcrux? You cannot die. That's the purpose. If one's body is attacked or destroyed, one cannot die. So Tom's thinking, yeah, but if one horcrux is good, wouldn't two be better? If I could encase it here and here, if somebody finds this, they might not find that. Can you split your soul only once? Wouldn't it be better? Make you stronger to have your soul in more pieces. Notice, make you stronger to do what? To fragment yourself. If you think of the self as the soul. Is, is that pane of glass stronger as it is or stronger if I take a hammer to it? It's stronger as it is. Why? Because that's what it's designed to be. It's fulfilling its purpose like that. Okay? Merlin's beard, Tom. Because Tom says, isn't seven the most powerful magical number? Wouldn't seven, where's he going? Seven horcruxes. What does that mean? Okay, now what is a horcrux again? It's when you encase your portion of your soul in something else. So seven horcruxes would mean seven pieces of the soul out there in one where? Is that what he means? Or does he mean six out there and the seventh in here? So the seventh wouldn't be a horcrux. He's thinking seven's the magical number. All right? So Dumbledore brings him brings Harry back out. And Harry said, Do you think you succeeded? You think he made a horcrux? And that's why he didn't die when he attacked me? A bit of his soul was safe? <laughs> Notice, reading this in hindsight, after reading all seven, you, you start to hear all kinds of little ironic statements that Harry's totally oblivious to. But Dumbledore is not. A bit more. So they go on and talk. He says, as far as I know, Dumbledore, uh, Voldemort, as far as I know, as far as I'm sure, as Voldemort knew, no wizard had ever done more than tear his soul in two. How do we know? And notice what Dumbledore is suggesting. Though. First of all, who is that wizard he's talking about? What's the wizard who tore his soul in two? We're never actually told, I don't think. I think it's implied that it's Grindelwald. Okay? I'm not positive about that. But he says, <coughs> excuse me, Slughorn says, you split your soul by what? The supreme act of murder. How do you do it? By an act of evil. The supreme act of evil, by committing murder. Killing rips the soul apart. Dumbledore says, as far as I know, no wizard had ever done more than tear his soul in two. That doesn't mean me making a horcrux. That just means ripping your soul in two. How do you, how do, you do that? Go back to what Slughorn told Riddle. You kill somebody. And what happens? Your soul is torn in two. Okay? Dumbledore seems to be suggesting there's never been any mass murders in the wizarding community. Right? Because if you kill two people, then your soul is torn into three pieces. You kill one person, it's split once. You kill another person, one of those pieces, I would assume, just based on simple logic, 
is torn, who do we know killed 13 muggles? Peter Pettigrew. So does that mean Peter Pettigrew's soul should be in 14 little pieces? If we take what is written as quote unquote true, yes, that's what that implies. And yet Dumbledore says, as far as we know, no wizard has ever done more than one killing, has ever split his soul into more than two pieces. To me, there's a problem there. Peter Pettigrew killed 13 in one fell swoop. Okay, so maybe you could argue the killing the 13 counts as one. It's not what it implies. Anyways, they keep talking, and uh, Dumbledore mentions to Harry about the diary. Harry, I don't understand. And Dumbledore says, well, you told me what the diary did, and I put two and two together. The diary was a horcrux, right? Because what happened when Harry stabbed it with the fang? The ghostly Tom Riddle thing, kind of like the witch in the Wizard of Oz. No, 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 no. That part is dead. Harry, I still don't understand. Come on, Harry, get with the game. It worked as a horcrux. The fragment of soul concealed inside was kept safe. Okay? He says, then two years later, you told me on the night that Voldemort returned to his body, he made a most illuminating statement. I, who have gone further than anybody along the path that leads to immortality. Further than anybody. Dumbledore, I thought I knew what that meant, even though the Death Eaters didn't. He was referring to his horcruxes. Horcruxes in the plural, Harry. The diary wasn't the only thing. Voldemort had seemed to grow less human with the passing years. What's he look like now? Kind of like a snake. What is that showing us? Remember the opening of this book, the other minister, right? Fudge shows up, and he and the prime minister kind of compare notes about what's going on in their respective worlds. And what does Fudge explain? We're having the same week. He goes, uh, you, you mean you're having those? Yes. Why? Because what happens here affects, influences, bleeds over, use whatever terminology you want. What happens here? So what happens in the unseen slash muggle slash spiritual uh, slash wizarding slash spiritual world has repercussions over here in the scene slash muggle slash physical world. Voldemort splits his soul into multiple pieces in the unseen spiritual wizarding world and what happens to his physical, seen, material body. It is also fragmented. It looks less and less and less human. All right. Harry finally says, so he's made it impossible to kill him by murdering other people. Why couldn't he make a philosopher's stone? Or steal one? Uh, Harry, <laughs> go back. First year, Dumbledore. Well, he tried to do that, Harry. Remember? So they keep talking. The elixir of life does what, Dumbledore says? It extends life. You got to keep drinking it. You got to have an endless supply. It's not one sip and all's you know, done. All right? So Dumbledore says, quoting Tom Riddle, isn't seven the most powerful, powerfully magical number? I think the idea of a seven, notice, a seven part soul. Seven parts, not seven heart crises. One in himself, and then one in six other pieces. All right? Okay. 
Perry, two statements. He made seven, and they could be anywhere. After all, where do they know Voldemort spent time? Albania. He could have put it in a tree somewhere. No. Dumbledore, glad to see you appreciate the magnitude of the problem, Harry. In other words, good job. You're starting to wake up to the problems. He says, no, not seven horcruxes. Okay, Dumbledore, the idea of a seven-part soul, Harry, he made seven horcruxes. See, Harry hears that, and he's not thinking along the lines Dumbledore is. Harry's thinking seven horcruxes, but he's not thinking of the one part still in Lord Voldemort. Because that would make eight fragments, right? Dumbledore saying there's a total of seven. One in, one in Voldemort and then six others. That's why he says, no, not seven horcruxes, six. The seventh part of his soul, however made, resides inside his regenerated body. The seventh piece of soul will be the last that anybody wishing to vol kill Voldemort must attack. The peace that lives in his body. And you for, forget, Harry, you've destroyed one. And I've destroyed another. Harry took care of the diary. What is Dumbledore taking care of? The ring. It's why the ring is shattered and Dumbledore's hand is withered. Okay? We're going to go really fast in a few moments. So, he talks about that. And notice what he says. A withered hand does not seem an unreasonable exchange for a seventh of Voldemort's soul. The ring is no longer a war cross. Notice, a withered hand, it's an, it's an even, even exchange. The only problem is, it's not just a withered hand, is it? According to I'll shut up. Um, so, those two are gone. There's four more. What are each of these so far? Salazar, Salazar Slytherin, Salazar Slytherin, Algo Hufflepuff. What does he say to the other suggest? The other two are going to be. Relics of the Founders, okay? So we've got Slytherin, we've got Hufflepuff, we need Rowena Ravenclaw, and Godfrey Gryffindor, right? Does he get any of Gryffindors? No. Are there relics of Gryffindors still around? Well, yeah, we've seen them. The hat and the sword, right? Diary belonged to Tom Riddle. So, he says there's four more. Remember, Voldemort liked to collect trophies. These things suggest to me Voldemort would have chosen his horcruxes with some care. Harry, the diary wasn't special. He says, no, but it was proof that he was heir of Slytherin. Okay? That's why he considered it important. So, Harry... Notice, he's kind of moving ahead. The locket, Hufflepuff's cup. Good job, says Dumbledore. Remaining two, assuming again he created a total of six, are more of a problem. He says, I would think they would be from, you know, Gryffindor or Ravenclaw. I am confident, however, that the only known relic of Gryffindor remains safe. What's he talking about? He's talking about the sword. But it's not the only remaining relic. Because we're told by the sorting end that Godric Gryffindor whipped him, it, off his head and the Founders Four put some of their brains in it. So that's something else. All right? So, 
They keep talking. And Dumbledore says, Harry, what do you think about the snake? Nagini. Wait, you can use animals? Inadvisable. Because, you know, they can move for themselves, etc. So Dumbledore says, or suggests, one of them is Nagini. What's a good logical reason for assuming that? Okay, what else? How did Harry see Arthur Weasley attacked? You're the eyes of the snake. Okay. Notice what Dumbledore. Uh, I should not go there again. No, I don't. Um, okay, so keep going on. Harry says, all right, this is. Um, Around five uh, oh six or five sixteen five oh six or so five oh six to five oh eight. Harry, okay, so diary's gone, ring's gone, cup, locket, and snake are still intact, and you think that there might be a Horcrux that was once Ravenclaws or Griffin. Does Voldemort know when one of these is destroyed? Does he, does he feel part of his soul, you know? Dumbledore. Interesting question. I don't think so. I believe Voldemort is now so immersed in evil and these crucial parts of himself have been detached for so long, he does not feel as we do. Perhaps at the point of death, he might be aware of his loss. But he wasn't aware, for example, when the diary had been destroyed, until he forced the truth out of Malfoy. When Voldemort discovered that the, that the diary had been mutilated, robbed of all its powers, I'm told his anger was terrible to behold. So why is Malfoy still alive then? Interesting, you know, little question. Of course, Lucius didn't know what the diary was. Notice Dumbledore says. So he finishes that long paragraph. Poor Lucius, expressing some pity for him. What with Voldemort's fury about the fact that he threw away the Horcrux for his own gain and the fiasco at the Ministry last year, I would not be surprised if he's secretly glad to be safe in Azkaban. Okay? Because we're going to open up Book 7, and what are we going to see? Lucius is no longer safe in Azkaban. He's at home. But home isn't really home anymore. Because home is now where Voldemort holds court. And Malfoy is kind of like his gopher. Okay. Harry, okay, so if all the Horcruxes are destroyed, Voldemort could be killed? Yes, I think so. Without his Horcruxes, Voldemort will be a mortal man with a maimed and diminished soul. Never forget, though, that while his soul may be damaged beyond repair, his brain and its magical power remain intact. It will take un- common skill and power, Dumbledore says, to kill a wizard like Voldemort, even without his horcruxes. Harry, but I haven't got uncommon skill and power. Dumbledore, yes you do. You have a power that Voldemort has never envied. Seriously, again, Love. I know. I can love. It was only with difficulty that he stopped himself adding, big deal. What is that little interchange right there? Possibly reminiscent of, or what does it possibly echo? That we saw earlier in this book. Keep going. The old argument. You told me book five. I can love. Woo! Big deal. Yes, Harry, 
notice. You can love, said Dumbledore, who looked as though he knew perfectly well what Harry had just refrained from saying. Should, should Harry be aware that Dumbledore does know perfectly well what Harry was thinking? Does Harry know that Dumbledore is Ella Gillimans? Dumbledore told him already that he is not an unskilled Legilimens, or Legilimens, however you want to pronounce it. He should be aware that, you know, watch what he's thinking when he's around Dumbledore. That's why, you know, in the one uh, book two, he goes up to Dumbledore's office, and Dumbledore says, Harry, I need to know, is there anything you want to tell me? And he's like, no, no, nothing, not at all. No, I'm not hearing a disembodied voice saying, rip, kill, blood, tear, you know. Why? Because Ron said, hey, man, hearing imaginary voices isn't cool even in the wizarding world, you know. You don't want to go all son of Sam on looking up um, on him. So, which, that is, you can love, which, given everything that has happened to you, is a great and remarkable thing. You are still too young to understand how unusual you are. There he goes again, putting him down as being too young. But what's he mean? For someone to have had the life you have had, Harry, and to still be able to love is a pretty amazing thing. So when the prophecy says, I'll have power the dark Lord knows not, it just means love? What am I going to do, Dumbledore? Hug him? Run up, go, Tom, you, you, you know, you're loved. Drop the, drop the act. Drop the evil. Be nice to somebody, you know? Yes, just love. But Harry, never forget that what the prophecy says is only significant because Voldemort made it. So what is Harry still thinking about the prophecy? He's thinking it's like the Oedipus prophecy. It comes from out there in the universe, meaning this event is fated to happen. You cannot escape it. I told you this at the end of last year. Voldemort singled you out as the person who would be most dangerous to him. And in doing so, he made you the person who would be most dangerous to him? Notice, he didn't pick Neville. But it comes to the same. What's Harry thinking? Two go in, one come out. <laughs> one of us has got to kill the other. Dumbledore, no, Harry, it doesn't. You're setting too much store by the prophecy. But... You said the prophecy means, if Voldemort had never heard of the prophecy, would it have been fulfilled? If Voldemort had never heard a child born at the end of the seventh month to parents who had thrice defied the Dark Lord, right? if he'd never heard that, would Voldemort have come after Harry? No, there'd be no reason to, right? Would it have meant anything? Of course not. But last year you said one of us would have to kill the other. Only because Voldemort made a grave error. He acted on Trelawney's words. And, and notice the irony here in the subtext. Because anybody who acts on anything Trelawney says, right, is not dealing with a full deck because she's so clearly a charlatan. If Voldemort had never murdered your father, would he have imparted in you a furious desire for revenge? Of course not. If he had not forced his, your mother to die for you, would he have given you a magical protect, protection? Of course not. Don't you see? He created you. He created his worst enemy just as tyrants everywhere do. And, and she, she only includes this idea, this one spot. But it's really important. Just as tyrants everywhere do. 
Have you any idea how much tyrants fear the people they oppress? It's why they oppress them. It's why totalitarian governments try to have utter control. Because it only takes what to overthrow that totalitarian government? It only takes that one person to stand up. Because that one person stands up. And what does that do for everybody else standing behind that one person? It gives them a backbone. And they stand up too. And when you have one person opposing a hundred people, or you have a hundred people opposing a thousand people, which is also why many of you know what every totalitarian government, let's say in the 20th century, what's the, one of the first things they do when they come into power? And I, I'm not making a political statement. This is just a historical fact. They remove guns from the other people. They ban the ownership of weapons. Every single one of them. It's what Hitler did. It's what Stalin did. It's what Mao did. It's what the Kim dynasty did. It's what Castro did. All of them. Why? Because it's when those people have those weapons that they can fight back. You take the weapons away from them, what are they going to fight back with? Right? All of them realize that one day, amongst their many victims, there is sure to be one who rises against them and strikes back. Voldemort is no different. Always he was on the lookout for the one who would challenge him. He heard the prophecy. He leapt into action. With the result, he not only handpicked the man most likely to finish him, he handed him uniquely deadly weapons. Harry's thinking, what deadly weapons? I don't have any. I mean, at least he gave worm tongue, uh, worm tail, you know, the silver hand he hasn't given me, you know. By attempting to kill you, Voldemort himself singled out the remarkable person who sits here in front of me and gave him the tools for the job. He marked him as his equal, we were told. It's Voldemort's fault that you were able to see into his thoughts, his ambitions, that you can even understand the snake-like language in which he gives orders. And yet, Harry, despite all of this, what? Not even for a second have you been seduced by the dark arts. Of course not, Harry replied. He killed my mom and dad. You were protected, in short, by your ability to love. Notice, it's not by your desire for revenge. If your only experience of these books is the films, then it seems like they're all about one thing. Harry Potter's revenge against the Dark Lord. But they're not. The only protection that can possibly work against the lure of power, like Voldemort's, that is, love, is the only thing that can do what? Inoculate you against the desire for power. Why? Because love is the exact opposite. It's what I was talking about the other day. Love at its basic essence is humble, is humility. It's putting somebody else before yourself. In the the fantasy lit course I'm teaching, we read the, the Chronicles of Perdane, which is about a young boy named Taryn, and it's his growth story. And he learns in the fifth book, or he says in the fifth book, that he's learned what being a real hero is. Because from the first book on, when he's like 10, 11, 12 years old, he wants to be a hero. He wants to be a warrior, you know. And he makes the statement at the end of the fifth book, Being heroic, being a hero, is thinking more of others than of oneself. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm so wretched, I'm rotten, but so-and-so is a better person. No, it's putting other people's needs, wants, desires 
before one's own. Okay? Dumbledore goes on. After everything you've endured, in spite of all the temptation you've endured, all the suffering, you remain pure of heart. How do we know that that's true? Got to go for a moment into book seven. We're going to see Apologies Potion early in book seven. Apologies is going to be Harry's. We're going to have seven people that look like Harry Potter. Okay. What happened to the Apologies Potion that Harry, Ron, and Hermione made based on Crabbe and Goyle? What did it look like? Anybody remember? Snot. Bogies, we were told. Okay. What's Harry's going to look like, we're told. Pure gold. And Hermione's going to go, ooh, that looks tasty. And Ron's like, excuse me? <laughs> Pure gold. Why? Gryffindor, red and gold. Okay, yeah, possibly. What else? It's like transformation. And we're back to the beginning of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. The transformation from something base and common to something pure and noble and worthy and such. He says, you remain pure of heart, just as pure as you were at the age of 11, when you stared into a mirror that reflected your heart's desire, and it showed you only the way to thwart Lord Voldemort. Well, it only showed him that when... Interesting little important detail that Dumbledore doesn't explain here. It only showed him that after Dumbledore explained to him, one, how the mirror works, and two, if you should ever come across it again, now you'll know how it works. Because what did he first see in it? Himself surrounded by all of his family. And where are all of his family? Dead. I think Harry's, at that point, his deepest desire is to be with his family. That's only possible one way, to be dead. Well, he's giving a little bit away. He's kind of going to get his wish in the next book. Notice, you didn't want, Dumbledore says, immortality or riches. Harry, have you any idea how few wizards could have seen what you saw in that mirror? Voldemort would have, should have known then what he was dealing with, but he didn't. That is, when Voldemort realized you got the stone out of the mirror and in your pocket, he should have just slowly backed away. <laughs> in Professor Quirrell. But he knows it now. You have flitted into Lord Voldemort's mind without damage to yourself. But he cannot possess you without enduring mortal agony. He tried. I don't think he understands why, Harry. But he was in such a hurry to mutilate his own soul, he never paused to understand the incomparable power of a soul that is untarnished, pure, and whole. Now, does Dumbledore mean by untar untarnished, sinless, is Harry Jesus for the wizarding world? Several of you are shaking your heads. No, I think about it. He's not Jesus in the sense of, you know, virgin birth, son of God, all that kind of stuff. He is Jesus in the sense of Jesus is what? Deliverer, savior, protector, Patronus Potter. He's a type. Here he is. A type is something that points to its fulfillment. Like Samson in the Old Testament, Moses in the Old Testament, David in the Old Testament. They're all types. They're figures okay, that point to another. But Harry says, it all comes down to, that is, that's really nice. You know, the last 40 minutes, we, that's really nice, Mr. Dumbledore. But it all comes down to the same thing. 
we both walk into the battle dome and only one of us walks back out. I've got to try and kill him. Dumbledore, got to? Of course you got to. But then he turns the tables. He asks a question. If you had never heard the prophecy, Harry, what would you think about Voldemort now? But you never heard it. What would you want to do? I would want to stop him. He says, I notice exact opposite of what Tolkien does with Frodo. I would want him finished. That's passive voice. And I would want to do it. That's active voice. With Frodo... Frodo says, I do really wish to destroy the ring, or er, to have it destroyed. Because Frodo realizes, after he makes the first active voice statement, uh, that means my going to Mordor. No, I'm not made for such perilous quests. Here, Harry's saying, yes, I want Voldemort dead. But notice it's presupposing he's never heard the prophecy. So why would he want to be the one to do it? Because of love. Not because of love of Voldemort. Because of what? Ron, Hermione, Jenny, Mel, Luna, Fred, George, Molly, Arthur, Tonks, Lupin, Siri. Just go down the list of names. The woes of Mrs. Weasley isn't only the woes of Mrs. Weasley, right? What does Harry experience when he sees dead Ron, dead friend George, dead Ginny, dead Arthur, dead Percy? It's like his adopted family. He doesn't want any of them to die either. Some are. You know, next book, it's like a great classical tragedy the bodies just pile up on the stage. You see, the prophecy does not mean you have to do anything. He's saying, Harry, you could turn around and walk away. But it caused Voldemort to mark you as his equal. You're free to choose your way, quite free. You can turn your back. But he'll try to hunt you down. And it makes it certain, really, that, yeah, I know, back to my point, that one of us is going to end up killing the other. Jump. Not all of you have read books on it, correct? Okay. I can still say this, though. But Harry, Harry never actually ends up killing anybody. That doesn't give anything away. But now he understood what Dumbledore was getting at. It was, he thought, the difference between, and she uses an image from real history, right? It was an image of being dragged into the arena to face a battle to the death and walking into the arena with your head held high. Why does she use the image of an arena? What is an arena? What's another term that she intentionally doesn't use because it would be too overt? It was the difference between being dragged into the Colosseum. Why doesn't she use Colosseum? Because the image there is of two things. Either Christians or slaves. They were the ones who were either dragged, kicking and screaming into the Colosseum, or we have eyewitness anecdotal accounts, we have letters that describe this. Walking in, head held high, chest out, ready to meet their death. Okay? Some people perhaps would say, there's little to choose between the two ways. 
But Dumbledore knew, and so did I. So do I, thought Harry. There's all the What is all the difference in the world? If you march in, head held high, chest out, what is that showing? About you and death. That is, go back to the end of the first book, your mind is well organized. You realize it's not you. Death is what Dumbledore says, the next great adventure. It's the doorway into something else. For Voldemort, it's what? It's the end. Or the great unknown that is to be ultimately feared. Ultimately, nothing else is to be feared more than that. Okay? So, from here, we've got nine minutes. Sectum Sempra, don't want to say much about. Harry sees Malfoy in the bathroom, page 521. Sees Malfoy is crying. Malfoy tries to pet Harry. Harry uses Sectum Sempra, Sectum Sempra, nearly kills him. Okay. The seer overheard, chapter 25. She talks about the lightning struck tower. This is uh, 542 or so. Calamity, disaster coming near all the time. Um, and she tells Harry about Snape. Snape was the one who overheard the prophecy. Snape was the one, page 549, Snape was the one who told Voldemort. And Harry just blows up at Dumbledore. And you let him teach here, and he told Voldemort to go after my mom and dad. Professor Snape made a terrible mistake. He was still in Lord Voldemort's employ on the night he heard the first half of Professor Trelawney's prophecy. He hastened to tell his master. He did not know which boy Voldemort would hunt from then afterwards. Harry, he hated my dad like he hated Sirius. Haven't you noticed? Dumbledore, you have no idea of the remorse Professor Snape felt. Notice, Dumbledore doesn't tell Harry what? He loved your mother. Okay, that's going to come up later. So Harry's like, so how do you know Snape's on our side? Because I trust him completely. He doesn't give him what? Proof. He doesn't give him the evidence. Why? We're going to be told at nearly the end of the next book. Dumbledore made a promise. I would never tell. Okay? So, uh, let's see here. Chapter 26. Dumbledore and Harry go off to the cave. Dumbledore makes Harry promise to do whatever he says. Okay? They see in theory in the water and such. They go to the basin. Dumbledore starts drinking the water to get to what's in the basin. Um, he starts to drink it. He starts to cry. He starts to yell. He starts to yell. Everything. Harry gets him safely out of there. Chapter 27. Real quickly. Lightning struck tower. They see the dark mark. Um, page 583. Dumbledore tells Harry, go get Severus. Speak to nobody else. Wear your cloak. Okay. Let's see here. And then just before Harry can, well, Harry can't because he gets stuck, Dumbledore petrifies him. 
um, Malfoy comes up, uses Expelliarmus, takes Dumbledore's wand from him, and notice, here he sees all this. In the film, where is Harry? You got the tower like this, okay? Here's the top of the tower. Here's the platform you stand on. Stairs or ladder, stairs or ladder. Harry's here. Snape comes up and does what? Anybody remember? I do remember this because I've seen it now. He goes. Like Snape telling Harry, shh, be quiet, is going to do any good at this point, right? Because what does Harry want with Snape? Just his life. He wants to hold his life in his hand and squish it. And Snape just says, shh. he doesn't put any spell on it. But in the book, Harry's over here. He's up here. He witnesses everything. With Malfoy and Dumbledore, when Snape comes up, when Fenrir comes up and the other Death Eaters, he sees it all. But he's got the invisibility cloak on. And he's been frozen. Back to the beginning of the book, right? Where he has the invisibility cloak on. He's in Malfoy's carriage. And Malfoy does Petrificus Totalis. And he can't do anything. Okay? So we see, and we're not going to talk about it, we see Dumbledore and Malfoy talk back and forth. We find out all the ways Malfoy has tried to kill Dumbledore throughout the school year. You know, the opals and silver necklace that Katie Bell got because Madame Rose Merton was put under Imperius curse. Okay, The um, poison drink, the poison chocolates. So up comes Fenrir, and then up comes Snape. And we see, end of that chapter, there stood Snape, his wand clutched in his hand. This is the last page. Somebody had spoken Snape's name. Severus. The three Death Eaters fell back without a word. Even the werewolf. Snape gazed for a moment at Dumbledore, and there was revulsion and hatred etched in the harsh lines of his face. From whose perspective? Harry's. Harry sees Snape looking at Dumbledore, and he sees nothing but revulsion and hatred in Snape's face. Severus, please. I'm not a Boom. Okay. A jet of green light shot from the end of Snape's wand hit Dumbledore squarely in the chest. Where is Dumbledore physically at this point? leaning against the wall, and he has slumped down to the ground, butt on the floor, back against the wall. And what happens? Special effects, right? It's like he goes off the springboard. Boom! Goes up over the battlements and off to the side. What happens to everybody else when they get hit with the Avada Kedavra? Severus gets hit... Uh, Severus gets in, he's standing next to Harry, and there he is, right next to him. Okay? But Dumbledore goes out in style. When this book came out, there was a lot of chatter on the internet. <gasps> he's not really dead, because this isn't what happens to people when they get hit with that. This was something between Dumbledore and Snape, where they... And even when they find his body... He's got blood trickling from his mouth. What happens when you hit with a vada kedavra? You're dead immediately, right? Heart stops beating. A non-beating heart in a body, the body doesn't bleed. There's nothing to push the blood out. So when Dumbledore hits the ground, he shouldn't bleed. Fly to the prince. We have the battle go on. We have Harry use Snape's Snape's 
curses against himself. And he's like, don't you dare, you know, use my own curses against me, etc. Meaning Snape is who? The Half-Blood Prince. Why Prince? Eileen Prince. Half-Blood? Like who else? Voldemort? Snape? Harry? See, I've got a problem with that. Harry's not a half-blood. His mom's a witch. His dad's a wizard. Okay, his mom's parents are muggles. She's a half-blood. So that would make Harry, what, a quarter blood? 16. Notice the problem you develop with that kind of mentality. You, you end up with the Elizabeth Warren problem. Is she Cherokee or is she not? Well, she ended up having 23andMe or DNA or whatever. And she's like 1 1,064th. Okay? How far back do you go? You know, kind of a thing. So, page 6, 15. Oh, and we're over. Okay, we're going to spend probably 10 minutes, 20 minutes at most on Wednesday uh, to talk about what's talked about in that chapter of the Phoenix Lament. And then we'll go on to next book. Definitely Alice, because we've got five, yeah, five days. All right. And I will get a quiz.